So um, uh, the way that works, the next two weeks, we're going to be working on chapter eight and chapter nine. I don't know how far into chapter nine we're going to get. Uh, there is the next quiz, but the next quiz is for two weeks. So uh, it will be due a week from today. All right, sorry, two weeks from today. So two weeks from Monday, that first quiz is due. Okay. And um, that will be the next thing you have to do. So I heard some from some people that there's been some issues with connecting with tutors um, who are um, comfortable with organic chemistry. So I am still available, if, you know, plenty of time. So if you want to meet with me, I'd be happy to um, help you with the quiz, help you answer questions, uh, whatever. Just let, let me know what times work for you what, when you want to meet. And we can do that. The third exam right now is scheduled for two weeks from now. Um, that will, uh, after, it's like the third week from now. That we may end up pushing that off another week uh, just because we're now kind of slowing down with material and I there won't be anything on there won't be anything to have on that third exam if we don't finish at least a couple chapters. So um so stay tuned with that. It'll e either be where it's scheduled on the syllabus or it'll be the week after that. All right, are there any questions or things you want to go over before we start today? We're gonna to go today we're we're gonna to look at the um last quiz, which we hadn't really gone through yet. And then the, um, and then we'll get more into chapter eight. Anything before we get started? Okay. Well, um, I've got the quiz open here. So if you have any questions or you need to jump in, go ahead and do that. You're also always welcome to just turn on your audio and, um, you know, ask questions or whatever too. Okay, uh, so this is eight. Nucleophilic substitution reaction of a halo alkane. We've been talking about that for a while now, so that's just where the um, nucleophile can come in and substitute for the halogen on an alkane. And hopefully um, you're comfortable with this by now, but an SN1 reaction, is two steps it forms a carbocation um, you can say this however you want but loss of a stereo center or um if it doesn't form uh it's, it's not stereo selective or stereo specific whereas sn2 is the opposite of, of those things one step no carbocation formed the rate depends on this Nucleophile, there's a lot of things you could say here. So as long as there were some uh, some differences there, that's fine. Okay, oh, and then I guess some of that comes over into this third question too. So the SN1 um, products will be a couple things to keep in mind. One is be, they're all dependent on the carbocation. So the carbocation causes a couple different things to happen. For one, you're not going to get, um, or you're going to get a loss of stereochemistry or a racemization or something like that. Also, you can have carbocation shifts. So that means that your substitution product may actually be in a different carbon on a different carbon um, than what you'd expect. Uh, so all of those are possible with, um, with SN1. SN2, you expect to get inversion of configuration based on, uh, from the starting material. And there's no carbocation shifting, so you can you won't shift around where your substitution product could potentially be. All right, factors predicting an SN2 mechanism. So we talked about the um, several factors. We look we can look at the substrate. So a primary substrate is going to favor SN2 mechanism um, as a secondary generally. The stronger nucleophile favors an SN2 mechanism. A polar aprotic solvent favors an SN2 mechanism. Um, the only thing that is going to be the same for both of them is the leaving group. Uh, this, the 
better leaving group is better for both of them and doesn't favor one over the other necessarily. Um, so when you explain these, one thing is just for your own check here, I, I won't be too worried about this from a grading perspective, but certainly as we get into the next exam, make sure that you understand the reasons behind all those effects. So why does a stronger nucleophile uh, favor an SN2 reaction? Well, it favors an SN2 reaction because the um, rate at which a strong nucleophile will attack the substrate is going to be greater than the rate at which that leaving group dissociates from the substrate, assuming it's a secondary carbon or something. So this is an example. And uh, see if you can justify to yourself why each of those effects um, has the effect that it does. OK, and then um, this is dealing with the stereochemistry again for each of these substitution products. So let's draw these. We are doing a SN2 substitution here, which we know because we have a strong but not terribly basic nucleophile, um, and we have a secondary substrate here. So our product, we would expect, will have the in inverted configuration. Now, there's a couple ways you can draw that. You can kind of do the more literal version where you show it coming in from the other side and, and kind of pushing everything. Uh, off this way. Okay, so it's actually coming in from over there. And that's going to cause the methyl group to get pushed up this way and the hydrogen here and this staying over here. Um, the problem with that, I mean, there's no problem with that. That's still good, and you should still get that inversion of configuration if we check our stereochemistry. So one, two, three, this is a S stereocenter. And then over here, we've got one, two, three, um, that's an R once we rotate the hydrogen over to the other side. So, um, you know, that, that's fine. I think this is a little bit harder to see and harder to tell what's going on. If you, if you just want to rotate this around, and I'll say this is or because it's actually the same, same should be the same product, we can just leave everything together as we would in like a line structure and show the inversion of configuration just by, oops, just by flipping the location of stuff. So my H here. H2 here. Sorry, this should be an H2 over here too. Um, so either one, either of those are okay. Those those say the same thing. And again, we just want to check with our stereochemistry. One, two, three, that is R. So we go from S to R. Okay, this substitution product, um, again, with the really, really strong nucleophile, we would often actually say that this favors elimination, but in this particular question, it specifically says, just look at the substitution products. So we're only gonna look at the substitution products here. Um, so we would once again, expect to get SN2 substitution. So now in this one, we have our first situation in this question where we're definitely going to look at an SN1 because we have a neutral solvent type molecule and a tertiary um, carbon. So we can expect to have um, SN1 substitution, meaning this is going to uh, come off and form a carbocation, and then we get both possible stereoisomeric. It's not really stereoisomeric products in this case, um, we're actually going to look at just one product because there's no stereo center here. So in this case, if we're drawing it, if we're going to keep it in the chair confirmation, right, we would have this. 
Now we would also have the other chair confirmation, but that's just a confirmation, right? Those are always flipping back and forth. We don't have to actually draw those as two separate products uh, in this case. In this, for this one, we could just draw, sorry, I don't get that out of my head here. Okay. Um, we could just draw this because, It's the same thing, right? not a stereo center, not a stereo center. So we don't need to specify stereochemistry either in the chair form or otherwise. Okay, uh, same thing. So in this case, it's a little bit different because while it's true that this isn't exactly a stereo center, it does matter whether it's cis or trans to this other one. It is kind of a stereo center. We didn't really talk about how we deal with those kinds of things. But in this case, the top and the bottom clearly are different because they can either be on the same side or the opposite side of this isopropyl group. Um, if you want to keep it in the chair conformation, that's fine. But let's take a look at it just flat because it can be a little bit easier to see. So one product is going to be this one. And let's just keep this up. So we'll have the product like this. And then the other product is going to be flipped. And if you do that in chair confirmations, that's fine too. Um, but keep in mind here that uh, the isopropyl group has to stay the same position in both cases. Um, that's a common mistake sometimes with um, kind of getting that in your head, oh, stereochemistry is flipped or stereochemistry is lost, only at that particular carbon where the reaction is happening, not like the whole molecule. Okay, uh, I can't save this one, so we'll just rename it. Which of the following reactions will go faster if the concentration of the nucleophile is, sorry, that should be increased? Uh, explain. So uh, here we have to think about what does it mean for a reaction to go faster if the concentration of the nucleophile is increased? So what type of reactions depend on the concentration of the nucleophile that's only SN2 reactions. Uh, only SN2 reactions depend on the concentration of the nucleophile. So this is just another way of asking, which of these would you expect to go through an SN2 um, mechanism? And that should be this one and this one, but not this one. C is not affected by the concentration of the nucleophile because, um, the, uh, because the SN1 mechanism the rate determining step is the dissociation of the leaving group and doesn't have anything to do with the nucleophile. The nucleophile coming in is the faster step later, so that doesn't really affect it. All right, we good with those so far? Okay, moving on. All right, just a second, I have to answer a question here. Sorry, I'm back. Um, okay. What products are formed when they undergo beta elimination reactions? We looked at these a little bit last week. Um, I know because there was a question. So in this case, you want to look all around that center at all the different beta hydrogens. So we've got beta hydrogens here, here, and here. 
And any of those could potentially be deprotonated uh, to give us beta elimination products. In some cases, like in this one, we also have to think about E and Z um, or cis and trans. So there could be potentially many different products formed um, through via beta elimination reactions. So let's start drawing them out. We want to do this kind of systematically. So let's look first at what happens when these hydrogens get deprotonated. So when, when one of these gets deprotonated, that means we're going to have an alkene right there. And there are two possibilities there because of cis and trans. Also, no, that's the same. No, that's yeah. That's the same. So, this is um, the E, and this one is Z. So there's those possible those possible ones made there. Okay, then let's look at these hydrogens down here. There's only one possible product there. That's this one. And then we could also deprotonate this one here and get that product, as well as the uh, Z version of that. Sorry, that's wrong. Which is this one. Okay. And then it's also a good idea. Sorry, let me move that out of my head. Um, it's also a good idea always to look around and see if there's a possibility of carbocation shifts because we know that the tertiary, uh, or I'm sorry, carbocations can shift around to other tertiary carbon. So, we, we do see that possibility here, but in this case, that would actually make all the same products, so it doesn't affect anything. So there are five possible products um, in this uh, beta elimination reaction, and the most likely major products are, especially when we don't see the base specified, the most likely major products are the most substituted, so the, the alkenes with the most other carbons uh, connected, and they should be... Um, Generally, E products are going to be favored over Z products. So I would say the most likely major product here um, are going to is going to be this one, and this one probably also a bit. And these other ones will be uh, minor products. But this reaction would be a big mess. So you'd have to choose your base really carefully if you only wanted one of those products. We haven't really talked about how to do that. This one, um, we have a little bit fewer possibilities here. Um, again, let's look at the leaving group and all the possible beta hydrogens that could be deprotonated. So there's no hydrogen here. We don't have to worry about that one. Uh, there is one here, here. There's three there. Those are all going to give you the same product. And then there's two here. Also expect to give um, product. So, there's those possibilities, and then we'll also look at uh, E and Z. Okay, so there's the alkene from those that we would get from elimination from those. Then we have that one from these two. But then we could also make the um, Z version of that. So three possible products there. And we would expect um, the major product again is the more substituted one, the Z, the E, and then the Z would be the 
also probably formed. And then the last one. This time we're in a ring. We don't really have the possibility of uh, E and Z. So we can either deprotonate these or these, but the ones on the ring are all going to form the same product. That's the only one that's going to form something different. So the two possibilities here would be this one and that one. And between those two, that's the major product. More again, the more substituted alkene. This alkene has three different carbons attached to the carbons. This one has none. All right. Products of an E1 reaction mechanism different from those of an E2 reaction mechanism. Um, so there's there's various levels of answers here. Uh, so what I would expect is Excuse me, what I would expect from you is that, yes, the products can be different, um, mainly because E1, uh, E1 reactions form a carbocation, and therefore you can have the possibility of carbocation shifts, which can give you different regio isomers. Um, then you would also say that the you could also say that the E1 reaction mechanism or the E1 products are different in that the larger the base, the um, the more selective an E2 reaction is to the less crowded areas. There are some other considerations here too. I um, they do say that I, I think they say this in the book. Like when you have a cyclohexane, you need to have um, axial uh, you need to have diaxial substituents for the hydrogen and the leaving group, also with rotating double bonds. So there can be some EZ stereoisomeric stuff with E2 that's not with E1. We didn't go over that. We didn't emphasize that. So the only thing that I'm um, really concerned about with this question for our purposes in this class is that you recognize that an E1 reaction goes through a carbocation intermediate and therefore is going to have all those issues with carbocations that we've talked about. If you also said the other stuff because you looked it up and that's what it said or something, that, that's fine. But that's not the kind of thing I would expect you to know uh, for an exam. And an E1 reaction is expected to occur, occur preferentially, generally, whenever we have a tertiary carbon. Also a weak base. is to figure out which mechanisms dominate um, and find the products from that. All right, so here um, we definitely have a tertiary substrate with a good leaving group. So this is definitely going to be SN1 and E1. We don't have any strong nucleophiles, strong bases, whatever. So we would expect SN1 and E1 products here. So an RSN1 product is this one. I think we went over this last week too. And our E1 product is this one. And as, as it's, the, um, it's hard to distinguish between those two because SN1 conditions and conditions are pretty much the same. So we would expect both products. Down here, the difference now is we have a strong nucleophile or strong base. Now this could be potentially be a good SN2 nucleophile, but we still have a tertiary substrate. So that means we can't have any SN2. So if we can't have SN2 and we have a really strong base, then the favored mechanism is going to be E2. And so we would expect to get primarily elimination and not substitution. Okay, that was the quiz. Um, I will get through those. It, it just, sorry, it, it takes a lot longer to grade these things electronically. Um, 
but I will get them. I will get them back to you um, as soon as I can. So, any questions about the quiz before we move on? All right, I'll take that as a no. I don't have to greet you anymore. All right, so last time we were talking about um, nomenclature of alcohols. And so today we're going to look a little bit more at alcohols. Oh, so you're trying to come in. Okay. Uh, we're going to look a little bit more at alcohols and uh, some of their properties and their reactions. Um, we're, I'm not going to get. I'm not going to go through as much in this format as we would in class, um, just because there's not as much back and forth interaction. You know, in class, I would usually put up an example and let you work on it while I walked around to see what you did. And, and we're not really going to do that here. So um, we'll probably not make it the full hour and 15 minutes, but I just I don't want to like put out too much information at once. So um, I'll, I'll be managing that and I'll appreciate your feedback as far as the pace goes and whether you're doing okay keeping up with stuff uh, as we go through these weeks. All right. So just to remind uh, from last time, if we could take a look at um, some nomenclature of alcohols. Try this one. All right, see if you can write a name for that one. If anybody wants to Try to say the name once you've got it or type it into the chat window. Uh, I can check it. Otherwise, I will tell you in a little bit once you've tried it. Anybody got a name yet? All right, thank you, Irina. Uh, 1R3S3 isopropyl cyclohexanol. Um, that looks right to me. So we've got our alcohol taking priority here with number one, isopropyl on number three. So isopropyl cyclohexanol. We don't have to put a one when the alcohol is at one. Uh, we assume that if it's not given, so we can say that's why there's just three isopropyl cyclohexanol rather than three isopropyl one cyclohexanol. Um, and then the stereochemistry, we have an R here and we have uh, an S over here. Actually, wait a second. over there. Any other name? Um, what do you mean 
uh, you know, what, what Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you could name this one cis also. Yeah. Um, because they're both on the same side of the cyclohexane. Generally, it's more specific if we can use the uh, the absolute configuration, R and S. But if there's only two, you can say cis. Yes, that's fine. All right, great. Thanks. All right, so some properties of alcohol, some things that, that we should know um, about them. So, of course, the, the main part is the OH. That's what makes it the alcohol. And so that means that they're going to be able to have to undergo hydrogen bonding. The other types of functionalities that we've looked at so far this, uh, this semester, things like alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, alkyl halides, those were primarily dominated by dispersion forces, the nonpolar forces, um, as well as maybe some dipole forces with the halogens. But now we have these structures like ethanol, where if we draw this out a little bit, we can see a strong dipole there, big polarity, which then and connect with others in that same way, right? And really have these strong attractive forces. Um, so that means that alcohols are going to now have much stronger intermolecular interactions and therefore higher boiling points than alkanes, alkenes, alkyl halides, um, those sorts of things. So if we look at some of those, those numbers here, Right, just for comparison, methanol has a boiling point of 65 degrees C, whereas ethane, which is basically the same size, has a boiling point of minus 89 degrees C. So you see um, a really, really, really big difference in boiling points for two otherwise similarly sized molecules. Uh, where am I? There it is. Um, so very, very different boiling points from similarly sized molecules. Um, and that's all due to that hydrogen bonding interaction. So in general, if we see these molecules with things like OHs and NHs, we can expect higher boiling points for otherwise similarly sized molecules. And that's probably something you talked about in a previous uh, chemistry class, but it does affect their properties a lot. Um, so, so we'll continue to look at those uh, with respect to alcohols. The other thing that is affected by the, um, by the OH and molecular forces is the water solubility. I want to pull in um, a little piece from the book here so you can see this. So I'm get this to work. Okay, this table might be a little too small to see, um, might be kind of blurry. I don't know how well it's coming through, but uh, this is on page uh, 251, uh, sorry, 231 of the book. That's good, you can see it? Okay, good. Um, and this shows some, some alcohols here and their corresponding alkanes. And then this is... Um, This is molecular weight, and this is boiling point. And then this is water solubility. OK, so a couple of things we can see here. One is what we just talked about, that similarly sized molecules 
the one with the OH is going to have a massively higher boiling point in pretty much all cases. Um, the OH makes those much stronger intermolecular interactions, which uh, leads to that higher boiling point. Okay, so we see those. The other thing we see is a trend going from the top to the bottom here of the boiling points generally increasing in all cases. So ethanol, 78, butanol, uh, propanol, 97, butanol, 117, pentanol, 138. Um, even though those are still just with one OH, that effect is because of the rest of the carbon chain. So when molecules get bigger, those dispersion forces get stronger and they can attract each other more. Uh, so that's what's responsible for that change in boiling point as we go, uh, as we get bigger and bigger and bigger. If we were to then add another OH there, like we have here on 1,4-butane diol, then that boiling point jumps up again uh, significantly because of the um, because of the possibility of more forces with that extra OH now. So, um, so you can see that that happening that trend there. The other interesting trend here is the water solubility. So you see ethanol has infinite water solubility, which means you can make whatever mixtures of ethanol. You know, you can put a tiny bit of water in ethanol, or you can put a bunch of ethanol and water. However, you want to think about that. That all mixes fine. Propanol mixes fine. But then as we get to butanol and pentanol, the water solubility actually starts to drop and it starts to become less and less soluble uh, as, we, as we go up. So why do you think that is? Any guesses? Why does the water solubility drop as the, as the um, molecule gets bigger? If we still have OH is there. What do you mean by the ratio, Lena? Yeah, those are good. That's a good guess. Yes, of OH to the other part of the molecule. Yes, that's that's correct. Of the OH to the other part of the molecule, um, that each OH, let's say, can dissolve a certain number of or compensate for a certain number of carbons. But if we think about what's going on in there in solution, uh, we've got like let's let's look at how a molecule like uh, butanol. Can interact. So you can now you can have these polar interactions here, but now you're also going to start having uh, stronger dispersion force type interactions, right? Like like these kinds of forces, the nonpolar forces that just depend on overlap. Uh, and so it's going to be as these molecules get bigger. It's going to be increasingly difficult for water, which is the solvent here. Say there's some water around here. It's going to be increasingly difficult for the water molecules to kind of break apart these nonpolar interactions. Um, so the bigger those nonpolar pieces become, the more they're going to want to stick together more and not be broken apart. And in order for something to dissolve, it has to end up being surrounded by water molecules entirely. So the water molecules will surround, can surround a small OH molecule, but not the bigger ones. What, then when you get to something like 1,4-butane um, diol, because you now have two OHs, those can be dissolved, set, those, those kind of make a, a two sides of the molecule that can now be, um, that can now be dissolved by the, by the water. So for each OH or each polar functional group, you can dissolve a certain number of carbons, but once that chain gets too big, you start to lose that solubility again. So that's kind of an interesting effect of, of these organic molecules. So that's why, like if you learned in general chemistry, okay, we, we, we draw the Lewis structure and then we decide if the molecule is polar or nonpolar. And if it's polar, it dissolves in water, and if it's nonpolar, it doesn't dissolve in water. 
Well, that's not quite true. Um, these molecules are very polar. The polar, the polarity is on one side. The dipole that you could draw is that way. It's very polar. Um, it's not just about how we classify that molecule as polar or nonpolar. It's about how do the different parts of the molecule interact. And as we look at these bigger and bigger organic molecules, the idea of different parts of the molecule behaving differently becomes more important. So we have to look at the individual bits of the molecule uh, rather than thinking of it necessarily as a whole thing uh, when, we look, when we think about properties like this. So another effect of that we've already talked about a little bit is acidity. Alcohols have acidic hydrogens. That hydrogen can be relatively easily deprotonated. Uh, does anybody remember off the top of your head what a general approximate pKa for an alcohol is usually? Throw out a number. Yeah, about 15. That's a good guess. Yeah. Um, because water we know is 15.7. So alcohols are going to be in that 15, 16, 17 range generally. Um Some types of alcohols, uh, so putting the carbon on there, sorry, let me do this a little bit differently here. So water is 15.7, um, ethanol is, 15.9. It's not really an even trend because there's some various things going on here. But um, if you look at isopropanol, we can do 17, uh, 2 methyl, 2 propanol, goes up to 18. So the more carbons you have coming off of that carbon that's attached to the alcohol, the more that. Um, uh, the more that that you uh, make something less acidic, basically you're destabilizing the um, oops, sorry, you're destabilizing the oxygen, uh, the the negatively charged oxygen. So that's uh, yeah, so that's what's going on there. Uh, but in general, we can make a pretty good prediction that most alcohols are going to be about the same pKa as water, which you know, 15, 16, 17, something like that. We can always look those up if we need to beyond that. All right, so the last thing we're going to look at today uh, is we're going to look at one, one reaction of alcohols, which is the basically the same uh, SN1E1 mechanism that we've already looked at, but applied to alcohols. So um, one thing that you might notice and actually you can there's there can be some some SN2 stuff going on here. SN1 and SN2. If we have an alcohol, let's say like cyclohexanol. And we imagine that reacting with some nucleophile, even a particularly good nucleophile. We're not going to see our standard substitution products. No reaction here. 
Uh, the reason for that is that bromine is a weak base. Bromide. And if we think about the potential leaving group here, if this were to leave, then our leaving group would be OH minus, which is a very strong base. So if we just think in terms of like um, that kind of, uh, of equilibrium, it doesn't make sense that a weak base is going to displace a strong base, and you're just going to have OH floating around. O OH in general is a very, very poor leave leaving group. And so we're generally just not going to see OH as a leaving group by itself. So what we have to do is essentially activate it to make it into a good leaving group. And there's a couple ways to do that. But the one we're going to look at now is to use acid. So imagine if instead, leave that there, but imagine if instead we, took, we started with that same cyclohexanol, but now we're reacting with HBr, hydrobromic acid. Well, the first thing that would happen in this case is we could protonate the alcohol. And a protonated alcohol, which is now OH2 with a positive charge, now suddenly this becomes a pretty good leaving group because that's water. So now we have a decent leaving group. We have water as a leaving group. Um, and so, oh, got blurry. I don't know if that's from, from your end or my end. Um, yeah. Well, hopefully it still saved it for me and, and I can upload it. Okay. Hard to see. Well, hopefully it, it comes back in or at least at least the video is okay, so you can catch up with this on, on YouTube if it's not working uh, at the moment. Um, maybe it'll kick back into it, maybe an internet speed issue. If you do want to follow along, uh, as usual, the notes are in the notes folder, uh, so you can see what I've written if it's, if it's hard to see uh, this way. Also, this would be page 230. Thirty-four on the book. Yeah, two thirty-four. So if you've got the book, you can follow along and see some of the figures here. That's that's basically what I'm copying here. All right. So um, so we protonate the alcohol to make water, and then generally, what's going to happen is alcohol can leave to form a carbocation and that will act that that may happen before the bromine comes in so everything and then and then water is is the byproduct here So sorry if that's hard to see. Everything from this point, from the second step forward, let me uh, highlight that here. So everything in those brackets is just typical SN1, what we've already talked about in the last chapter. The only difference here is that we need to react with an acid instead of a base or a, a charged nucleophile because we need to protonate the alcohol first before it can be a leaving group. We can also do that then with uh, our E1 mechanism. And this is often called Hydration. Um, as you might expect, that word dehydration means loss of water. 
So if we lose H and OH uh, through an e E1 type mechanism, that's generally referred to as dehydration. And so you can, you can take alcohols and you can heat them up with acid and get them to form um, alkanes. So let's take a tertiary alcohol like this. And we're going to heat this up. So often this triangle symbol, um, it's the Greek letter delta, and that's used to mean heat, so a, a difference in temperature. Okay. Uh, this requires heat because uh, it has a, a pretty, a, a bit of a higher activation energy because you have to get that alcohol to leave. So the products there will be the dehydration products. The major product will be this one. And then a minor product will be the other elimination reaction. Okay. Has the video cleared up at all? Is it still, still can't tell what I'm writing? Oh, it's better? OK, good. But let's look at that mechanism. Um, now, what I want you to do I want you to try to draw this mechanism. And I'm going to give you a, a hint and a start here. It is an E1 mechanism, an E1 type mechanism, which you already know. The only difference is we have to make sure to protonate the alcohol first to make it into a leaving group, just as we did up here. So you're going to protonate the alcohol, then proceed by E1 mechanism. So take a couple minutes and see if you can draw that yourself uh, before I draw it for you. Give it a try. I think you can do this. You know the E1 mechanism. All you have to do is that first step. Okay, so question from Yasmin. So dehydration of alcohols can be SN1 or E1? Uh, so kind of. Um, dehydration is always E1. Uh, dehydration assumes E1. So we're just losing the water and nothing else is coming in. Um, it is true that acid or that alcohols can also react for substitution. The, the difference is not the presence of heat so much as the um, presence of a nucleophile. So if you imagine what's going on here is, yes, we could still do substitution here, but we end up with the exact same thing because we're substituting OH for OH. So we're never going to get any kind of different substitution product if we only are dealing with acid and water. If we have something like a nucleophile, like, like a halide, like a, uh, um, a halogen acid or something like that, then that's when we can get that substitution product. So if you just see water and heat, all that's going to happen is E1 elimination or potentially E2 elimination if we have primary substrates. So you need a, a different nucleophile there to have a, um, a substitution product.
All right, everybody get a chance to draw it? So let's take a look at it. Um, again, as, as I said, the first step is what we already know. It's, or I'm sorry, the first step is the new thing. The first step is, deprotonate, or is protonating the alcohol. That looks like that. That's what's new. Everything from this point forward is typical E1 mechanism. So we... Who's our leaving group? Then we deprotonate one of the alpha or beta hydrogens. So actually that OH that comes off can act as a base in this case to complete the E1 mechanism. Now you notice this is catalytic acid, much like addition to a double bond, because we have now acid that's regenerated. So our, we will we start with H3O plus, but because we're using the OH to deprotonate, we're going to end with H3O plus also as one of the products. Okay, so. Other things to keep in mind here. Notice that the backwards reaction here, we have a double bond, acid and water to get an alcohol. That was a reaction from back in chapter five. So how do we preferentially dehydrate if we're using the exact same reagent to go the other way also? So both reactions use the same conditions. How can you possibly make one um, more than the other. So there is some equilibrium here that we have to worry about uh, because we're using, again, the same reagent can do the forwards reaction and the backwards reaction. And the way that we deal with that is uh, for one, it, uh, changing the concentration of the alcohol, of the acid. So in this case, we want really um, concentrated acid because we don't want a lot of water in there. A lot of water is gonna push us in this direction. Uh, in the left to the left direction. In fact, doing this, depending on, on how you're doing it, but often when you're trying to dehydrate, you actually have to set up a lab apparatus to pull the water out as you're doing the reaction. So something that absorbs water that can actually take the water out of your reaction to get it to work. Otherwise, you don't get good yields. Um, so for dehydration, we want to get rid of the water. So you want to think of having as little water as possible. So really concentrated acid and getting rid of the water as it's formed. And the opposite, the hydration of alkenes, we want just the opposite. We want plenty of water. So in that case, we're going to use dilute acid. Um, and, and I think there's a question about this on the quiz also. But if you just keep in mind, think about, do I want to be adding water or do I want to be taking water away? Dehydration, I want to be taking water away addition of water, I want to be adding water. So if I'm taking water away, I want there to not be a lot of water. If I'm putting water in, I want there to be water. I feel like I just said water like 30 times. Take a look at that. Uh, the book discusses that a little bit as well. Yes, water. Um, and so that'll be our first reaction here from the alcohol chapter. Uh, so pr practice those a little bit. You can start looking at at the homework, uh, hopefully in chapter eight. Then um, next uh, on Wednesday, we will look at some oxidation reactions of alcohols, uh, some ethers, and and some maybe some epoxides, some of the other interesting stuff in chapter eight. 
So I don't have to run here, but I, like I said, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves since we're, we're, we're trying to stretch things out a little bit, give you a little bit more time to digest everything and practice everything. Um, take a look at the quizzes. If you want to stick around and ask any questions, uh, homework questions, quiz questions, whatever, uh, I'm welcome. I'm, I'm happy to stick around. Uh, otherwise, I will see you on Wednesday. Uh, thanks, everybody. Hope you're staying healthy and safe and in your house if you can. All right, so in the last example, more water, the, run, the one, yes, right. The reaction favors the reagent side, yes. Which makes sense, right? Because then you're adding the water. So you're going to favor the side that has the water added to it. Wednesday before class, yeah, what time? Like, like nine? Earlier? Okay. Yep, I'll be here. There you go. Uh, perfect. I'll look over some of the uh, homework problems, and if I have any of them, I'll ask you about them on Wednesday. Great. Um, you can also. I don't know if you've tried it, but if you have a way to, if, if you want me to see your work, there should be a way to share your screen if you have stuff that you want to show me um, as, as the video. I'm not sure how that works. I have a button that says share, share my screen, but I don't know if you do. Well, I'm using my phone and my laptop at the same time, so okay. I'm not sure on which side i would have to do the share my screen or if you can get the camera going you can always just like hold stuff up too um if you want me to see your specific work i have the book so if you have like a question number i'll have that ready also okay i'll take a look through um quiz nine and, and see if i'm i'm understanding it um okay. i had a horrible time again this morning with the other tutor and okay. I think I